Thank you for listening to this fantastic show on the Crawl Space Media Network. We want to talk to you about another show on the Crawl Space Media Network. You got to subscribe to Crawl Space. Crawl Space is a true crime and mystery podcast hosted by the creators of Missing Maura Murray, which happens to be us. That's right, Tim. It's you and I. We also host Crawl Space. It runs the gamut of the true crime genre, and we try to apply our deep dive investigative techniques into cold cases and missing person cases like Brianna Maitland, Brandon Lawson. We also discuss the mystery of Suitcase Jane Doe, the Colonial Parkway murders, and a number of other cold cases, mysteries, and just strange occurrences. And we also converse with experts in the field of criminal psychology, law enforcement, and crime media. Want to know how to catch a liar? Or what it's like to wear a wire and get a confession from a juror in your son's wrongful murder conviction? Crawl Space has it. Want to know what it's like to escape a serial killer just by happenstance? We got that too. So go ahead and check out Crawl Space. Subscribe to it on your favorite podcast app right now. There's no reason to wait. Do it now. 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 You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill. Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. And we are setting aside our coverage of Brianna Maitland for a little bit, and we are happy to introduce you this week to our friend Lisa Zambetti. She is the co host of Real Crime Profile and the co host of Killer Casting. We are thrilled to be able to sit down with her and talk all about her projects as well as her work on the hit TV series, Criminal Minds. It's a fantastic conversation. We hope you'll really enjoy it. And it occurred to us that we're almost closing in on our first year here on Mind Over Murder. This conversation's a little lighter and a little more fun, which we thought wasn't a bad idea with the holidays upon us. Yeah, we love sitting down to talk with Lisa. She has long been a supporter of our endeavors, both with the Colonial Parkway murders case and with our podcast. So we were thrilled to have the time to sit and hang out with her and get caught up on her events and projects. We also had some very exciting news in the true crime community this week. In addition to several more cases being solved using forensic genealogy, which we're always excited about. The news broke just in the last day or so that the Zodiac cipher has been cracked. This is the so-called Zodiac 340 cipher. These are coded messages that the Zodiac apparently sent to the San Francisco Chronicle and other media outlets. Mm -hmm. There are four coded messages. One of them was cracked years ago, which was a relatively easy code. He used more and more complicated codes, so three codes remained uncracked, and the so-called 340 was the longest of the messages, about nine lines or so. Our friend Mike Morford, who many of you know from his several successful true crime podcasts, there's a joke that any true crime podcast uh, (laughs) that Mike is involved in results in a solution because he was one of the leading podcasters and journalists covering the Golden State Killer case. And Mike tends to get inside information and before anybody else. And it happened again with the Zodiac 340 cipher. Morph, as he's known, posted mm, probably two days ago now, Mm -hmm. Thursday, that the code had been broken in the Zodiac 340 cipher. And that three guys, David Aranchak, who's a software developer from Virginia, yay Virginia, Sam Blake, a mathematician from Melbourne, Australia, Yay, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll say Jarl Van Eck, yeah. a computer programmer from Belgium. Yay, Belgium. Yay, Belgium. The three of them cracked this code. Now, David Aranchek, who has been the spokesperson for the three of them, has been trying to break the Zodiac 340 cipher for 14 years. 
my God. And the cipher itself was contained in a message that was sent to the San Francisco Chronicle in December 1969. So that's almost exactly 51 years ago. People have been trying to crack this code for more than 50 years. And David Aranchak personally has been trying to break the code for 14 years. The FBI's cryptographers, they actually have a group that break codes, have been trying as well. And thousands and thousands of people have tried to break the code. On December 3rd, just about a week ago, the 650,000 different combinations <laughs> that are based on a program that Mr. Van Eyck, if I'm saying that right, his program began to see phrases jumping out, which really caught their eye, like gas chamber and mm -hmm. things like that, which obviously, okay, now the thing is translating into English somehow. There's an excellent YouTube video, which we'll put in our show notes here, the link to about a 17 or so minute video yeah. where David Aranchek explains the work that he, David, and Jarl did to solve the cipher. It's actually fascinating. And yeah. as I said, Kristen, it's actually clear enough so that those of us that are civilians can actually understand the thing. It was very, very cool. I watched it two or three times, and each time I was like, this is great. Like, how fantastic. So, yeah, definitely. We will, we will put that link up. It is wonderful. The nine-line message is kind of the same sort of self-aggrandizing BS that the Zodiac always put out. There's nothing mm -hmm. in the message. I know I was hoping for this, too. There's nothing in the message that says who he is or was, keeping in mind this is 51 years ago. If he was in his 20s or 30s, he might be dead by now. He doesn't out himself or anything like that. And it's kind of the same drivel that he was putting out 51 mm -hmm. years ago about having slaves in the afterlife. And, you know, there's some pretty seriously eye-rolling stuff in there. At the same time, I don't mean to make light of the fact that this guy's a brutal murderer. And he liked to play these games with the media, the San Francisco Chronicle especially, because they were covering the case is a hometown story for them. Kristen, you and I were talking about this a little bit offline. This is one of those cases for millions of people around the world, me included, and I think you. Definitely, yeah. Where it just seems to have caught our imagination. Mm -hmm. And I think it's all the strangeness with the, not just the, the way the terrible murders happened and of course him preying on young couples. I think it's the bizarre messaging to the yeah. media and the backstory of writing to the San Francisco Chronicle and that sort of thing. What do you think? That certainly is part of it, for sure. Um, that is definitely what caught my eye with the Zodiac. It is worth mentioning that every year or so, we get people who come to us on the Colonial Parkway Murders group and say, hey, have you guys considered that maybe maybe Zodiac is responsible for the four double homicides that make up the Colonial Parkway murders? We have no reason to believe that Zodiac is responsible for these. We have no reason to believe that he was on the East Coast. Now, people have said, but you don't know that he wasn't on the East Coast. That is true. <laughs> we don't know that he wasn't. But as we see from this cipher, Zodiac loved engaging with the media. He loved taunting the media. He was very, very forthright and certainly wanted attention. And we have never seen anything on that level with any of the double homicides that made up the Colonial Parkway murders. And that in and of itself, like for me, I'm not a profiler, but I read a lot about it. For me, that's really the big indicator that Zodiac is not involved with these cases. I'm sure we're going to get plenty of disagreement, as always happens. But to the best of our knowledge, Bill and me, the Zodiac is not in any way involved with our case, we do not think. We have even had a chance to discuss this with FBI profiler Jim Clementi. And Jim feels that the MOs of the Colonial Parkway murders, which he has studied, and you'll see more of that in a couple of months now yeah. when our television series comes out. Jim, who had studied Zodiac and worked with the profilers and investigators who had been leading the charge in the investigation of the Zodiac, Jim said the same thing. He said one of the things that's lacking is that publicity-seeking aspect yeah. of, of what Zodiac did. Even in this latest decrypted message, he mentions that wasn't me on the TV. Now, that was a, mm -hmm. there was television coverage at the time 
that purported to be uncovering something about Zodiac. This is again in 1969. And he's even making the point that wasn't me. So he's very much attention seeking, narcissistic, me, 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 me. We don't see that in the Colonial Parkway murders at all, as far as we know. As always, we thank you all for taking the time to leave us five-star ratings and reviews. We do ask that you continue to do so if you haven't done so already. Here's the English teacher assigning you your homework. (laughs) Um, We're always very interested to know what you all are thinking about the work that we are doing, and we hope to improve with every episode. Thank you so much for listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. And we are happy to be joined today by Lisa Zambetti, the casting director for CBS's Criminal Minds, co-host of Real Crime Profile, and host of Killer Casting. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Oh my God, don't be so formal. Goodness gracious. (laughs) You know how much I love both of you. I'm so happy to see your beautiful faces. I know your audience can't see your faces, but seeing you is just does my heart so good. I don't think I've seen you since CrimeCon. Oh, no, yeah. Oh, my gosh. In, is that in true? In New Orleans. I How long ago? Right. It, God, it feels like a lifetime ago. Yeah, it really does. It's I think that was um, a year and a half ago. Last, last June, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, what a time. We we survived a hurricane <laughs> coming through New Orleans. And, but it's so good to see you. I'm so happy for this show. I, you know, I'm so proud of both of you. Oh, and you. I'm so happy to be here. Well, thank, thank you. you. You're actually one of the people that encouraged us to get into podcasting. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot to thank you for. Full disclosure. You have the best voice. Yes. Oh, thank you. Listeners, if you listen carefully, you may hear some jingling. Oh. And maybe even a little dog sounds (laughs) because Lisa (laughs) is taking care of a special guest. Who's your special guest? My special guest is Buddy. So last night at the last minute, I got an emergency call from a rescue that I volunteered for before, and which I highly encourage your listeners to do. And they had a dog, Buddy, that they were rescuing from a terrible situation. And they asked if I could take him in. And, you know, these days during quarantine, Animals really make a huge difference in your mental well-being, your emotional well-being. And I was like, I can't say no. (laughs) So I have a huge golden retriever here who just wants love. He's been in isolation for far too long with an abusive owner. And the minute I saw him, the minute my children saw him, he was just completely wanting love. And so, you know, I have to keep him right next to me, (laughs) you know, and uh, he's getting used to this new environment and people who actually are here to love him. So if you if you hear a jingle, it's just his little leash. But please, if you if you can, right now is a great time to volunteer because you know many people are working from home, and I'm very blessed that I can work from home, and my children are going to school at home. So he's going to have a home full of people to give him some love. So please forgive any jingling you hear, and I have to like keep the doors open to keep fresh air flowing, so I'm not in a you know a, an enclosed oral space right now that's perfect for podcasting i'm at my kitchen table but please forgive that no well i think buddy just won the lotto in terms of a really nice people to stay with with you and your sons (laughs) oh well it's our pleasure it's our it's our privilege so anyway but i am here to talk to you what am i here to talk to you about you guys know everything about me and i've had bill on our podcast a million times and uh what are we talking about today guys Well, we certainly want to know more about what you're up to with your new podcast, but for people who aren't familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional background first? (laughs) Or my unprofessional background, as it may be. So yeah, so I um, had the privilege of being the casting director for Criminal Minds. It's a little show that was on CBS for 15 years, (laughs) and in honor of... Kristen, who I know is a huge fan, I'm wearing my Quantico sweatshirt that we all were given. We've all been given such great gifts over the years at Criminal Minds. But anyway, so I was a um, casting director on Criminal Minds. I cast psychopaths, victims, doctors, FBI agents, every you know everything in between. And it was just the love of my life and so privileged to work with the writers and producers, but also, as you know, with Jim Clementi, who is a writer-producer on Criminal Minds, but he started off as the consultant 
to, and really the, the show got greenlit because of Jim, because Mandy Patinkin, you know, was so taken by Jim and his story as a FBI behavioral analysis profiler, which is a very rarefied air. And so, yeah, I've been very privileged. And I know our friend Jim Fitzgerald has consulted for a while on Real Crime Profile. Laura Richards has also had input on certain scripts that, you know, she was brought in to give her very professional opinion on. So it's just been like a big family that just keeps expanding and expanding. But um, I loved casting for that show. I gave if I may say so myself, I gave many actors their first job Mm -hmm. that propelled them into space and propelled them into other careers. And I was very lucky, especially in the last few years, as we were wrapping up the series to cast some very special guests like Danny Glover and Jane Lynch and actors who were brought in to kind of send the show off. And it was just a great freaking love story of my life. I love all the series regulars. I got to know them very, very well. And all the crew and the and everybody behind the scenes that you all will never know who brought that show to life. And yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I'm a huge Criminal Minds fan. Our um our listeners know that I am a huge CSI fan because we did have a <laughs> writer from CSI on and I was a total fangirl about oh it. Oh my gosh. Do you and <laughs> I thought you and David Rambo were gonna run away together. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm I'm trying to keep my fangirl glee uh, to a a much more repressed well, level. No, these time. fans, it's, it's because of people like Kristen that keep these shows on. Our fans are longtime viewers, very loyal viewers. They know the ins and outs of every character. They know every cast change. They feel every cast change. And we've had a few, and that's the crazy thing. It's it's almost like how Law and Order has survived, but our series regulars have had massive changes. And for whatever reason, the brilliance behind the producers of the show and the heart of the show and the fans of the show kept us on for 15 years. I mean, think about that. The people on the show have had weddings, births, Mm -hmm. divorces, deaths in the family. I mean, we have gotten to know each other on a whole other level than many, many other shows, you know, and we just survived through I mean, I think for a while, our biggest competition was uh, American Idol. (laughs) And then it was, you know, something like was always up against us at some point. And we just kept chugging along and kept surviving. So that's a testament to CBS, to ABC Studios, who was our producer, to Erica Messer, who's our showrunner, and all of the producers and people behind the scenes. So a big thanks to them. Do you mind if we get into a little bit more about casting in that Mm -hmm. some of our listeners know that I've worked in film and TV, but, you know, for the labor unions and organizations that were outside the nuts and bolts part of the television business. In my limited experience with casting and my perception of casting, I always pictured you and other casting directors sitting behind like a folding table almost in a room and asking actors to come in and read for parts. How did casting change over the 15 years that you were directly involved in casting Criminal Minds, for example? Okay, so how has casting changed? Oh my God, Bill, that is such a huge, huge thing. So diversity, 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 and inclusion is something that has hugely changed. So um, when I first got into casting, before I worked on Criminal Minds, you know, producers really didn't want to cast people of color in bad roles. I mean, roles where they were drug dealers and the villains and stuff, they were just very sensitive that they didn't want to perpetuate any stereotypes, you know? And so on Criminal Minds, I think that was the same. We, we, we didn't want to make it. Well, certainly because these, the show is based on real cases, you know, some of Jim Clemente's real cases and, and other real cases that our producers have studied. 99.9% of serial killers are white men, right? So there's not a lot of diversity in the people who are going to be cast in these juicy roles, that they are juicy roles as the unsub in our world, right? So you have to kind of really search. You have to search for the things like the case that Jim worked on, like the DC sniper, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that, where there is diversity in the uh, offender. So on the one hand, that's, great that we're not perpetuating 
an untrue stereotype. But on the other hand, it's not great because you're not giving a BIPOC actor a role. You're not giving them a job. So that's always the struggle. It's like, here's this great role um, <laughs> that's going to pay you in like $8,000 for the week. Okay. And I want to give that to the best actor and that best, you know, but we can't, but because of, you know, this conflict between who to cast and how is that going to be seen? And, and is that going to do, do, do more damage than good? I can't cast an actor of color in that role. And sometimes we've had um, directors of color, BIPOC directors who are like, I do not want to see an actor of color play this psychopath. I right. just the don't. Bad, the bad guy role. That. Right. And I understand that completely. And, but then you have, you, then you have the network and the studio saying, no, no, as much diversity as possible, please, please. You know, we're beyond mm-hmm. that now. We're beyond, we really want to have just a colorblind casting or an incredibly inclusive casting that doesn't just include ethnicity, but includes ability, includes disabled actors and deaf actors. And, and we want to, to, I don't even know if I want to say this story because it's so sad, but you know, we wanted to include actors of different abilities in roles that were just normal roles, right? It's not mm-hmm. a role that's written for an actor in a wheelchair. It's not a role that's written for a deaf actor or a blind actor. It's just a role. And that's what, that's what my partner, Becky Silverman, and I tried to do. And we did get bumped on, you know, by certain people saying, well, we can't accommodate that person. We know we can't, why don't you just wait till we write a role that's for a disabled actor? And it's like, that's not the point. They don't (laughs) want that. They want to just be seen as actors. And Mm -hmm. in any way possible, if I can cast someone in a role that it doesn't matter if, I mean, I so much wanted to cast a medical examiner who was deaf. I mean, I just thought that would be just the coolest thing to show a scientist, you know, who's deaf and maybe has to work with a, um, it's either translator or um, interpreter. I don't remember which is the role, but, and, and have one of our series regulars know American sign language and right, be able to communicate. Right. I mean, I just thought oh, that yeah. would be the cutest thing. But every time I would mention it, it would be like, there's just, it's extra cost to hire an interpreter. It's you this, mean, it's just that. Like, you just know? like the real world. I mean, come on, it's crazy. Yeah, exactly. And finally, we did cast a, an actor who used a wheelchair and, as a reporter because I thought, well, how hard can that be? They don't have to, you know, they're a reporter. They can be anywhere. It was, a, it was still, I don't want to say they didn't want to accommodate it, but it was definitely, it was a huge conversation on how to accommodate that, that it made me very sad that we got that. Anyway, that's a really long question, but, you know, casting directors, we are always trying to be inclusive. It's, it's just drilled into our DNA. We want to reflect Um, the America that we know and the America that we don't know. When you are looking to cast someone in the role of the unsub, the psychopath, someone like say C. Thomas Howell, who played, you know, the Reaper, how, what what do you look for in an actor to determine whether or not they're going to be able to adequately, you know, play an unsub with, you know, particular menace and panache, I guess. So this is a collaborative process. It starts with a script. You read the script and in your mind, you just think, what is the nugget of this? What is the energy of this? There's a lot of different people who could do this and you want to bring in a spectrum of people. And then you sit down, you know, fortunately on our show, and this is not true for a lot of shows, we, I could actually walk up to the writer's office and plop down on their couch and say, okay, why did you write this? Who is this based on? What were you watching that made you? And a lot, and there is, a, you know, it's important. Like some writers had just watched something that's, you know, it might be a very um, obscure independent film that they watched or a documentary they watched. So I really want to get to the nugget of where the inspiration for the character came from. And then we just start spitballing and talking like, does it feel like this? Does it feel like this? What's the world? You know, um, how obvious is this person as a psychopath? Are they a charm and harm kind of person that you'd never suspect? Like Bill? <laughs> like Bill Thomas? <laughs> gee, um, gee, thanks. Or, <laughs> or menacing like or Kristen. Or are they some... Right, right, exactly. Or are they someone that you see the crazy coming? 
that you sent. You know what I mean? Chris, right. Chris, let it so, be. Like Kristen. Uh, like <laughs> Kristen's waving. Yeah, that's me. Right. So I wasn't there. I wasn't uh, in the casting department when they cast the Reaper. But what a great idea! Because oh then you're also thinking about what actors have we not seen in a while? Mm-hmm. What actors haven't done this kind of role before? You know, so there are the tried and true, you know, list of actors that you could bring in. And also, do you want a a um, a guest star level actor that's going to cost you a lot of money but be worth a lot of money, or is this kind of one of these unsubs that we can give a newcomer a shot and it, we, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody super fancy. So you know, the powers that be at the time had the brilliant idea to bring in C. Thomas Howell, and I really think it, it regenerated his career. Oh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and when I see those, and then, then we ended, then when I was uh, in the casting department, we did end up bringing him back and back and back and back mm-hmm. because, oh, he's wonderful. You know, the fans really, yeah, he, they really responded. And so that just goes to show that we are listening to what the audience's reaction is. We are, we're trying to grow the show and, and develop it, you know, the history of the show based on what works. So, so does yeah, that, so that was great. Does that mean you would reach out to the agents of certain actors mm-hmm. and say, has he or she mm-hmm. ever thought about doing, you know, a guest role on a show like ours, or we've got a role that might be right for so and so? Yep, exactly. And sometimes, so we 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 put down the roles on something called breakdown um, that goes out to all the agents and managers. It's like this is what we're looking for this week. These are the roles we have this week. And we look at who the who the agents are pitching to us, you know, pitching. Uh, I hear buddy. Pitching to us. Just, I know. Um, and sometimes it'll be it'll be like all the normal looking, crazy, psychopathic looking actors. <laughs> and once in a while. Yeah. Like, Bill. and then sometimes it'll be somebody like, oh, whoa, I I never thought of that person, but yeah, there's a kernel of that in there's a, you know, I, I think that there's pathos in procedurals. There's pathos mm-hmm. in psychopaths. There's damage in there, you know? So if you see an actor, even if they've only done comedy or if they've only done a certain kind of genre, if there's something in them that you see, yeah, this could work. That's the beauty of, of my job to see that, you know, and then sometimes we'll make a list, you know, we'll just make a a list of ideas of actors who were not submitted by their agents or managers. And we'll call them up and say, okay, what is this guy doing? Would he be interested in this? And we make an offer. So that's called offer only, which is the very rarefied air of actors who only get offers. They don't have to audition. They don't have to meet the producers. They just get an offer. So I wasn't there when C. Thomas, I don't know if he auditioned or not. I'm not sure. However, it came to be. That was great. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy, free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. Do you like our show, Mind Over Murder, and want to create your own podcast? Well then, let us tell you about Anchor. First of all, it's free. And who doesn't love free, right? I like free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more platforms. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I like the sound of that. 
It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Right here, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started on your own podcast. You can tell them Kristen and Bill from Mind Over Murder sent you. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. Another one of our great villains was Mr. Scratch. Mr. Scratch, Mr. yeah, Mr. I was going to say. Mr. Scratch. And Bodie, who's a very, he's a pretty well-known actor, he auditioned for that role. And we auditioned, oh my God, we had so many, so many sessions for that villain. But Bodie was just, he gave a look to the camera that we're just, based on just the look he gave, the little, at the end of the scene that he was auditioning for, he just kind of gave this little, I know this is visual, but he kind of gave this little look to the camera. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's it. That, that is, that is this character. And he won it with that audition. Some actors won't audition. And you mean um, they, that they, but some will. they refuse. In other words, I'm too accomplished for that. Correct. But that's a stock that goes up and down. So one year you might have an actor who's like, no, no, they're, well, it's really their agent is like, no, no, it's, this is an offer. He does, you know, his body of work speaks for itself. Right. You shouldn't have to audition for him. And I may be like, well, he's only done comedies. How do, you know, are my, Mm -hmm. I think he can do this role, but my director and my writer don't even know him. So, but then the next year, that same actor maybe didn't get the pilot they wanted or maybe their show was canceled Mm -hmm. or maybe things kind of turned down and suddenly their agent is like, he'll come in, he'll come into audition, (laughs) you know? So it it can, that's just, that's just our world. I mean, the stock of people, as you know, go up and down and uh, you just have to ride those waves. (laughs) And just from a a fangirl point of view, one of my favorite unsubs that you guys cast was Tim Curry. He did an amazing job. Oh my God. Was he, was he, uh, was he, did he have to audition or was that just like, Oh no, are you kidding? (laughs) No, I'm sorry. Dr. Frankenstein did not have to audition. He couldn't, if he did, we would have loved it. And if he came in his, you know, fishnet hose and a corset, that would be better. But no, he did that. And that was actually, that was before I joined the show, but I watched, that was the only episode that I watched after I got hired. I'd never even heard of Criminal Minds. I know that is like <laughs> anathema to you. But I'd never heard of Criminal Minds when I got hired to come on board. And that was the first episode that I watched. And it really, I mean, what an incredible, mm-hmm. oh my God, crazy performance that was. And and I was like, whoa, you know, this is this is really interesting territory. Let me add something, too. I, I don't talk much about this, but some of our listeners know I worked for SAG-AFTRA for a number of years. And I'll just mm-hmm. mention something. Oh, those of us that work full-time, this is a little bit hard to grasp, but actors don't work every single day. And mm-hmm. in order to qualify for your health insurance, which is an extremely important thing for all of us, mm-hmm. you have to earn a certain amount of money each year. Now, if you are a working actor, but maybe things have slowed down a bit or that sort of thing, you might look to a show like Criminal Minds if you could book a gig that would pay X number of days of sag after a scale, they call it. You know, you're looking to make enough money that year in that calendar year to qualify for health insurance. Did that kind of thing enter into any conversations you'd have with agents? You know, you were talking about when people are hot, you know, everybody wants them. And then someone that maybe isn't as working as much, maybe they've aged out of certain roles or whatever, they'd be more interested in that sort of thing. Did that enter into the pitches you'd get from agents? So for larger actors, let's just call them more more known actors, they don't say that directly, but you kind of discern that because I'm like, why are they why are they submitting this person? Mm-hmm. You know, this person is a little bit high level for this particular role. So they won't say that out loud. Now who now what we do do as casting directors as a family. Let's say that, and this happens, unfortunately, far too often. Let's say there's an actor who's about to run out of their insurance, like, you know, just a journeyman actor that nobody else would really know. And they have cancer or their spouse has cancer and losing their insurance will be a really big deal. A call will go out amongst us saying, hey, do you have any roles this person could be considered for? So again, you know, the best actor has to get the role, but you know, who you filter and consider 
is to our discretion. And if this is an actor who, oh my gosh, this is a great actor. And I, and I, this is a great reason to bring them in. And usually they're overqualified for the role. They're overqualified to be the, the cocktail waitress saying, here's your drinks or, or, you know, the, the medical intern saying, doctor, I think you need to come into this, you know, whatever. And so that's, that's something I can say. Now, again, we always want to serve the story and the show. So we're not going to just square peg round hole somebody into a role that they shouldn't be in. But, out of, you know, we could get 2,000 submissions for one role. Wow. So of those wow. 2,000, we always have to filter. We have to filter on, you know, a myriad of reasons. And sometimes those are, those are gut reactions, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's an art. I, you know, I hate to, to be too foofy about it, but it is an casting is an art and it's, it's an, it's an, it's an art of imagination and gut reactions. And, and uh, anyway, so if we can help somebody, we do want to do that for a little, for, you know, for a small co-star role, that can be a, the difference between having coverage and not. And that's important. We're, we're a family. Do people still audition in person? In other words, let's put COVID aside for a second. <laughs> let, let, yes, let's please do sure. that. Do people, actors, still audition in person? Is it all shifted to online? Pre-COVID, um, so let me, this is going to be very inside baseball, but pre-COVID, casting directors would pre-read people in person, meaning you come in person, you audition for me, and then I decide if you're going to come to a callback for the director and the writer and the producers, or uh, you come in in person for me, I tape you, and then I decide which tape I show to the producer or the director. So, uh, but yes, uh, you know, you would be seeing, you know, many, many <laughs> actors during each day, depending on the role. And as you know, in Criminal Minds, we'd have an average of 20 roles each episode. That's a lot. That's in addition to our series regulars and recurring roles. So you would see a lot of actors. That doesn't mean that the the direct the producers would see them in person. On our show, we did a lot of live producer sessions, but there are plenty of shows. I worked on a Ryan Murphy show where, you know, he never saw anybody in person. He only saw people on tape that I had taped or you know, that we had taped for him. So was that just Ryan's well, preference? Well, you know, when, you're, when you're somebody like him who has so many shows, I mean, this was like prime glee was happening. I mm -hmm. mean, he had so many shows on the air that we had to like call his assistant saying, can you please have Ryan watch this tape to see if we can cast this person? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it was already turning towards more uh, on tape auditions for the producers, but not for us, you know, not for the, the casting department, because we, we love actors. We want to see them. We want to hear them. We want to redirect them. They're going to come in with one choice and we want to give them adjustments and be with them. You know, we're rooting for them. Things were definitely changing. And now post COVID, you know, thankfully all the producers understand that it's all got to be online. It's all got to be via zoom. So I've worked on several projects since the quarantine and I have my own zoom auditions just like we are right now and I read with them on Zoom and they I record them and they do their scene and then I send those tapes to the producer and then we'll have a callback on Zoom. Now wow. for some producers that's a big change that's for some producers that aren't used to Zoom, you know, you have to convince them that I'm sorry, we cannot see this person in person. Unless you're going to rent me in a huge warehouse and put plexiglass everywhere and you know right. Mm -hmm. I, we're not going to put actors in jeopardy because you're going to have a ton of actors waiting in the waiting room and you're gonna have a ton of producers being in the same room. And I'm, you know, I, we're just not going to put our staff through that kind of thing. So right now it's, it's, everything is on zoom or EcoCast live. I want to give a shout out to a different platform other than zoom. EcoCast live is an internal uh, industry proprietary system that um, we use. So by the time you had arrived at Criminal Minds, you got to know Jim Clemente. And how did the idea for Real Crime Profile come about? Well, I think this is a, a rather complicated answer, but it kind of all came together. I was 
listening to the Heyman Lee uh, murder case, oh, okay. which we you're you're, you're going to know is serial, mm-hmm. and I was addicted to that. And whenever I had a casting session where Jim was the writer, I would always be kind of pouncing on him, like, "Well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And what's really going on?" And you know, um, you know, when we had the horrific San Bernardino um, shooting oh, incident, God, yeah. uh, that was kind of the same day that I had an, a, a session with Jim, and I was like, "What makes somebody?" do that you know they have a child that they're leaving behind on a certain suicide mission to not only kill others but to you know and he you know he gave me all of these answers and in long form you know he talked with me for a really long time and every time i'd seen jim on cnn or any other thing he's only got like a sound bite to get his answer right Mm -hmm. right So, but when he's with me and we're waiting between actors or we're waiting you know we're chit chatting and he can really talk to me in depth and with nuance. And so that kind of put it in my mind. And then I was listening to Bob Ruff's, this was before it was even called Truth and Justice, but Mm -hmm. Bob Ruff had a spinoff of Serial called Serial Dynasty, where he was continuing to investigate the murder of Heyman Lee. Mm -hmm. And one day Bob said, I'm really trying to get on this FBI criminal profiler, Jim Clemente. You know, I've emailed him. Hopefully he'll come (laughs) on. And I was like... What? I know like, Jim. My Jim Clemente? What? And I was like, well, how small is this world? Here is Bob Ruff, like in the wilds of Michigan, you know, podcasting from his shed. And um, I'm like, that's interesting. And I saw Jim shortly. Later, and I said, are you going to go on this podcast? He's like, oh, yeah, I got to get back to that guy. He's the fireman, right? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> you know. So I don't know. Anyway, so the podcasting, the true crime podcasting world was just beginning, you know. Mm-hmm. And so then Jim did go on Bob's podcast and I was like, wow, that was so awesome because Jim could really expand upon his knowledge and his feelings and he could really take his time. He doesn't have just 30 seconds to get in, you know, whatever. So the next time we were in a session, I went up to him. I said, I have a crazy ass idea. I would love, I I said, would you think about, and I was so nervous because he's so (laughs) intimidated at that time. I mean, Uh I know him now, (laughs) but uh, at that time he was such a mysterious character to me. You know, he's very intense looking. Uh He's very quiet. I mean, at that time to me, he was very quiet and very intense. Like he looked right through you, you know? And I was like, oh my God. But I went up to him and I said, look, I've been thinking, would you like to do a podcast where you can have a long form forum to talk about cases? And I would ask you about cases. And what do you think about that? And he was like, I would love that. And I was <laughs> shocked. I was absolutely shocked. And I said, you know, my, my husband has a podcast. It's a sports podcast, but he knows how to upload the RSS feed. He knows how to get it all out there. And then Jim was like, well, I have a studio at home that we could record. And so it was it was like, I have a bar and my mom can make the costume. We could put on a show. <laughs> we could put, put on a show. And then he came up to me later and he said, I have this friend, Laura Richards, who I've been partnering with quite a bit. And she would be great to bring on too, because no two profilers necessarily think the same way. Right. And she would just add a great element to it. And I was like, okay, sure. You know, I had no idea who she was. And then we were shortly thereafter at a Christmas party and I, and Laura and I spent many, many minutes in the bathroom, like talking about the show, what we could cover, <laughs> what we you know. So it really just kind of came together very organically and, you know, they had probably, maybe they'd been talking about doing a podcast too. I, you know, I don't know. I think probably that was in the, the zeitgeist, you know, starting a trip. But anyway, so uh, from my perspective, that's how it all came together. And we just, we didn't even have, <laughs> we didn't even have a title. You know, we got together, we started recording about making a murderer because that was so, so, such a huge explosive mm-hmm. Netflix series. And, and we just started talking about it and we found our way. We found our niche. We found our balance. And, you know, what makes this show work is, of course, we have two extraordinary law enforcement officers <laughs> with incredible case backgrounds. And, but we also have somebody who's like an expert at just being a human being and just 
my questions and my reactions to things. And, you know, I'm representing all the other people who are out there who have experienced crime and witnessed mm-hmm. crime and are empathetic to victims. And so it, that's kind of how it's all come together. I feel like you're kind of a stand in for all of us. I don't know if Kristen feels mm-hmm. the same way, but I feel like. Yeah, no, definitely. I've been lucky now enough to get to know the three of you pretty well, mm-hmm. but I feel like Jim and Laura both get into a lot of really interesting detail, and I learn a lot of stuff. Since I can't ask them live what I want to know, I often feel that you're standing in for the audience and asking mm-hmm. the questions that we want to understand. And I almost feel yeah. like you're our spokesperson on the show. And also, <laughs> well, a, a, you know, steering them a bit. <laughs> a tiny bit. Look, I mean, I think the thing, you know, as you all know, as your show is an example, true crime podcasts have exploded, mm-hmm. you know, over the past few years. And some of them are people who have zero law enforcement cred nothing to do with it and they're just talking about their opinions and that's great you know those are that's great that's one type people who don't know but they have a reaction to crime and that's awesome and anecdotal evidence and then on the other side of the spectrum you have true people with law enforcement cred who are droning on and on very professorially or just in a way that is that is great, but not a conversation. And I think with our show, we kind of try to bring that all together, the best of all of that. You know, if you, if you want to watch a lecture about criminology or behavior, you can just go to John Jay Criminal College and watch a lecture. You know, we're not tuning in to watch a lecture. We're tuning in to watch reaction to offenders and reaction to mm-hmm. victims and giving victims their voices. And that takes a human like me with no experience, but who is reacting to violence and reacting to injustice. And it also takes law enforcement who are the ones who solve those crimes and who are bringing justice. So what I love is that we've got that, you know, triumvirate, we've got that triptych, you know, we've got that three very different voices speaking about crime that we all experience. And for our listeners who don't know, uh, Lisa, Jim and Laura were good enough to feature Bill and uh, the Colonial Parkway murders on RCP. And, you know, we can't thank you enough for the attention to detail and the, you know, real empathetic approach that you took to it. Oh, my God. It was was our honor to have you on. It was fun. And it's funny. When I guessed it on Real Crime Profile, some people, some listeners criticized Jim, who can be, you know, he's a man of very strong opinions and all three of you weigh in. But it's funny. Jim was criticized by some listeners pretty strongly. They felt that he was challenging of me. We did this face to face, and I know you now with the technology and Laura's sometimes in the UK, et cetera, et cetera. You guys do the podcast sometimes remotely. This was the four of us in a studio. I Mm -hmm. like mixing it up and discussing different things, and we don't all have to agree. And Kristen and I have a longstanding commitment that we don't always have to agree on (laughs) every, you know, viewpoint on a case or whatever it is. You guys were wonderful, and I didn't feel that Jim had done anything untoward, but, you know, he had expressed some strong opinions, and I had expressed some strong opinions, and we kind of, you know, did did a little bit of, you know, just light head knocking in terms of a particular viewpoint, but I was really surprised later. People were like, Jim, you were mean to Bill, and that kind of thing, and I I hadn't walked away from my experience. We recorded four episodes over two different Sundays. Mm. You know, Mm -hmm. we did back to backs and I thought it was really cool. And it was one of my first times appearing on a podcast and being able to speak about the Colonial Parkway murders at some length. I mean, it was very interesting. The FBI actually, I didn't know they did this, but they actually listened to Real Crime Profile. And they actually, they they actually, no, they actually contacted us and contacted me. Oh my goodness. One of us had said something that they thought was a little too revealing. And so, you know, I had to call, uh, in this case, I called up Jim and I was like, Jim, they want us to take something out. And they had gone like to the exact minute and second and said, (gasps) we we would like uh, you to take this out. And it was already on the air. I, I didn't exactly know how podcasts work. I had just been a guest. Mm -hmm. So Jim said, yeah, that's possible. We can do that. And so you guys had to go back and we edited out a little snippet. So it it disappeared. I didn't realize 
the Federal Bureau of Investigation listens to real crime profile. <laughs> oh my God. And they actually <laughs> now, I, now I'm nervous. Yeah, they actually yeah. cared about what we talked about. And in my sister's case, the, the Colonial Parkway murders, they felt we were offering a little bit too much information in terms of what is still an ongoing case. You just triggered a million things in my mind right now. <laughs> so first of all, this is this is not a scripted show. Your show is not a scripted show. Neither is ours. So to you know, to the extent that what starts to happen, you know, the chemical reaction that happens when you have a guest on and somebody expresses one opinion and the other. I mean, that's a gold to me. You know, that's why we. And that's the real part of Real Crime Profile. It's a real reaction to real people's lives. Mm-hmm. And the other, so this is what I would say to that. Like if I would say, what the f- I mean, how long does this case have to go on? I mean, yeah. so what if we said something? What is that going to stop? I mean, are you about to bring in the killer? Well, I haven't seen it yet. I mean, <laughs> and then somebody like Jim would say, Lisa, you don't understand. So that's okay for me to be wrong. But I need to be able to have that, you know, that expression of frustration, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, we cut two minutes, two, what, 20 seconds out of a podcast. Okay, where is the killer? Oh. What did that accomplish? Oh, believe you know? me. Believe me. I, I, no, I feel I, the same I know. way. You're, you, I can't even come close to the frustration you must feel. But see, that's the thing. It's like you have to, I feel like I have to be able to have my reaction, Right. Sure. And it may not be PC. It may not be whatever, whatever, but it's just cutting through a certain amount of bullshit, you know. And then I have my co host to say, Lisa, it's not bullshit. This is why it's not bullshit. And then we all learn something, right? But if we're all just at a script and we're just all being polite and blah, 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 who? I don't want to listen to that. So, like, for me, I wanted to do a podcast. Believe it or not, you're going to, this is going to be shocking. I'm a very shy person. I'm very introverted. <laughs> My friends who know that I do a podcast are like, who are you? You know, I'm very <laughs> insecure. I mean, for the first two years of Criminal Minds, I didn't talk to anybody. I was so shy and so insecure. And Joe Montaigne would come up to me and say, hey, Paisana, and I would like pee my pants. You know, I wouldn't (laughs) even know what to do. Goobler would come up and hug and kiss me, and I would just like be in a coma afterwards. You know, I was very, Uh very shy and very introverted. So doing a podcast for me, and and also when, you know, when you're working on a big show, you you have a corporate entity that you're responsible to. You have to be very politically correct. You have to be very um, nonpartisan. You have to be very even keeled. But on my own podcast, I can freak out. I can cry. (laughs) I can ask questions. I can do what I want because it's mine. You know, it's ours, but it's mine. And so anyway, I don't know why I got on that tangent. But I know. know. For a real crime profile, you're the only civilian on the show. In other words, Jim and Laura are both these trained law enforcement people, and they're both you know, they have this extensive background as profilers, but sometimes they get really into some crazy level detail and you are the civilian, like I said, the stand in for us, because otherwise I'm afraid the two of them would go off on some, it might be fascinating, but it might be so confusing tangent. Whereas, you know, you're actually saying, whoa, 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 hold on here. I don't understand or put that in English or Mm -hmm. help us out here. Help us to understand why a perpetrator might behave in this fashion or why, you know, when you're discussing a television show or what have you, you get into the level of detail that can be kind of too much and you're steering it back to the more human side of the of the thing, which is how a lot of us got interested in true crime. Right. Well, we want to balance. There are definitely listeners out there who want that nitty gritty. Mm-hmm. They want that. They want as much technical behavioral analysis as they can get. And I completely love that and honor that. But I do always want to provide a balance that if we're getting very in a deep dive, let's pull it back and let's say it in a different way. Or, you know, sometimes I lob them softballs that I know they're going to hit out of the park. And then sometimes I redirect or I go back like, well, we forgot this or and sometimes I I have challenge them as you may have heard sometimes and it's not about disrespecting their experience it's just 
but what about this? And isn't this a contradiction? It's just about trying to understand and have continuity. We're not trying to have a gotcha conversation and nobody's trying sure. to be better than the other. And what you, what you mentioned, Bill, is when we covered television shows and we covered something like Mind Hunter on Netflix, right. or we covered Escape at Danamara, which was on Showtime, which we were blessed to get that sponsorship. They can comment from the real world side of things and I can comment from the production side of things. And I really love doing that. I loved breaking apart. You know, the study of acting is the study of human behavior. Mm-hmm. It is studying what it means to be human that's what an actor does that's what a writer does that's what a director does is holding that back up to an audience and so in some ways it is parallel to behavioral analysis you know i study how an actor speaks what they Mm -hmm. emphasize Mm -hmm. how they move what their gesture is what they wear tells me a lot about their character, where they live, what their wallpaper is, you know, (laughs) these are all planned and chosen things from the designers that are holding up what it means to be human to the audience. And I loved breaking that down for Mindhunter and several other shows that we've covered. Join us again next time as we continue our conversation with Lisa Zambetti of Real Crime Profile and Killer Casting. Two podcasts worth your while. Thanks for listening to Mind Over Murder. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. <laughs>